The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the HUD funding update webinar. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started now. Um, my name is Kate Seif, and I'm here with my colleagues Julie Klein and Jordan Press, uh, and today we're going to review the various fiscal year 2014 funding proposals for the McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Grants um, and other HUD programs, uh, along with their outlook. Um, and then we're going to uh, explain what we can do in September when Congress returns from recess to ensure that members uh, provide as much funding for HUD as possible uh, in whatever iteration their final FY 2014 funding legislation takes. Um, so a few quick webinar logistics before we dive in, uh, just to remind everyone that your lines are muted and we will be taking questions at the end of uh, everyone's presentation. You can submit questions, we'll take them at the end, but you can submit a question at any time throughout the webinar on the control panel box uh, on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, you can just go ahead and type it in and we'll receive it and get those questions answered uh, at the end. Uh, so as soon as you have one, go ahead and submit it and again, we'll answer as many of them as possible at the end of the call. Um, I also just wanted to say uh, that in terms of, if you're having any audio problems, um, it's probably the best to, instead of listening through your uh, computer speakers, if you go ahead and call in with the telephone option that it says there on your screen, um, you might find that if you're having audio problems, that will help things a little bit. Um, and also another reminder, we'll also post a recording of this webinar up on our website as soon as possible uh, and make sure that we get uh, the recording sent out to all of you uh, along with some of the materials we'll be discussing on this call a little later on. Um, so just to quickly run through the agenda here, uh, we're going to be walking folks through an overview of the various FY 2014 funding proposals for HUD programs uh, and covering all the big legislative activities that have happened around funding and sequestration in the past few months. Um, Jordan Press will then uh, provide us with an outlook on what's likely to happen with these funding proposals uh, and sequestration and some of these other big budget issues. Um, and then Jordan and I will also be cover covering some of the other legislative activity, uh, non-funding legislative activity um, that might be worth paying attention to over the next few weeks uh, and that we think is, is relevant to all of you. Um, and finally, uh, we'll be talking about the National Call-In Week we'll be launching next week to make sure that Congress uh, supports HUD funding. Um, so then, uh, as I mentioned, we'll of course wrap up with some questions, uh, which we should have plenty of time for. So if you have any, please feel free to submit them at any time and we'll make sure to get to them. Um, so without further ado, I will turn it over to Julie Klein, our Policy Outreach Associate, uh, to give us a recap of what's happening. Thanks, Kate. As Kate said, I'm going to start off by reviewing actions taken over the past half of the year that set the stage for where we currently stand in the federal funding process in relation to funding for homeless assistance programs. And then I'll provide a recap of what happened with the Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development, or T-HUD bills, in July and where things currently stand. To rewind a few months back, in March, the House and Senate each released budget resolutions, which are not law, but rather set guidelines to work within as the chambers move forward in the federal funding process. Budget resolutions lay out each chamber's vision for what the federal budget should look like, such as how money should be spent. And typically, the House and Senate budget resolutions each also lay out what each chamber proposes the overall spending level for the federal government should be. However, since these top line numbers have already been determined for the next eight years through the Budget Control Act that was passed in 2011, both chambers were working with the same top line number when they crafted their budget resolutions this year. It is important to note, though, that unlike the Senate, the House budget resolution robustly funded defense programs, which it was able to do through making deep cuts to non-defense, discretionary, or NDD programs. This impacted the total amount set forth in the budget resolutions that each appropriation subcommittee, including the THUD subcommittee, would have to work with in determining funding levels for programs under their jurisdiction. Therefore, although each chamber technically worked under the same top line number, the House and Senate set forth budget resolutions that drastically differed this year, reflecting the chamber's divergent priorities. Concurrently, the same week that the House and Senate budget resolutions were released, fiscal year, um, commonly abbreviated FY, 2013 funding levels were finally finalized through a continuing resolution, or CR, a stopgap funding measure that continued to appropriate funding for the majority of federal programs at their FY 2012 levels for the remainder of the fiscal year. This was all complicated by the fact that sequestration, the automatic across-the-board cuts of about 5% to nearly all defense and non-defense discretionary programs including virtually all homeless assistance and affordable housing programs, had gone into effect a few weeks earlier on March 1st. 
sequestrations cuts were therefore applied to the final FY 2013 levels, resulting in less funding for key programs for the remainder of the fiscal year. Although some programs, such as targeted homeless veteran programs within the Department of Veterans Affairs and various mainstream poverty reduction programs, um, such as TANF and Medicaid, were exempt with the rationale that they serve the neediest Americans, most HUD programs, including the McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Grants Program, were subject to the cut. Programs such as Section 8 and public housing were the first to bear the brunt of these cuts, and the loss of subsidized units has resulted and will continue to result in increased strain on the homeless assistance system. Homeless assistance, homeless assistance programs will directly feel the impact of sequestration this fall with the release of the next NOFA, and Jordan will talk a bit more about what may happen next with sequestration shortly. So after sequestration went into effect, FY 2013 funding levels were finalized and the House and Senate budget resolutions were released, the President released his budget proposal for FY 2014. Each year, the President releases a budget proposal that serves as a guide by outlining the funding levels the President proposes for federal programs. It is important to note that these are only suggested funding levels, since the President's budget proposal is not law and Congress ultimately makes the decisions through the appropriations process about what funding levels are included in the bills that fund federal programs. This year, the administration had the opportunity to use the budget proposal to find some middle ground between the Senate and House budget resolutions. So homeless assistance programs made out relatively well this year in the President's budget proposal. The administration proposed $2.381 billion for the McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Grants Program, which represents a whopping 19% increase over the post-sequestration FY 2013 level. This $2.381 billion for McKinney programs would include $346 million for ESG, um, or Emergency Solutions Grant Program, including $60 million in competitive grants to be targeted toward rapid rehousing efforts in high-need urban areas. The remainder, approximately $2.027 billion, would cover the cost of all COC, um, or Continuum of Care Renewals, prior to sequestration, and also include a bit of funding for new permanent supportive housing and possibly other projects. Overall, these funding levels would mean housing instead of homelessness for approximately 213,000 more people than flat funding would allow. The proposal also serves to lay out some concrete numbers on a program-by-program -program level to serve as a starting point for the House and Senate Appropriations Committees to consider in crafting their own bills. The legislation crafted by the Senate T-HUD subcommittee and passed by the full Senate Appropriations Committee would provide $2.26 billion for McKinney programs, and this funding level would include at least $336 million for ESG programs and cover the cost of renewals back to FY 2012 levels would be unlikely to provide any funding for new projects. We had high hopes for the passage of this legislation because it would provide $172 million more for the McKinney programs than the House version of the bill would. So the legislation crafted by the House T-HUD subcommittee and passed through the full House Appropriations Committee would provide $2.088 billion for McKinney programs, representing a nearly $160 million increase over the final sequestered FY2013 funding levels. This funding level would include at least $200 million for ESG programs, and the remainder, approximately $1.8 billion, would fund COC programs and would provide enough funding to cover COC renewals, although it would not get communities back to their FY2012 levels prior to sequestration cuts. In terms of other HUD programs, most programs similarly to the McKinney program received the highest funding levels in the President's budget proposal, followed by the Senate and then the House versions of the bill. For instance, the Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program received $20 billion in the administration's request, $19.6 billion in the Senate version of the bill, and $18.6 billion in the House version of the bill. Some notable exceptions um, to this include CD, CDBG, Home, Hapua, project-based vouchers, and public housing, which all fared better in the Senate version of the bill than in the President's budget proposal. So now I'd like to recap what happened with the House and Senate T-HUD bills. On July 23rd, the day prior to the Alliance's Capitol Hill Day, the full Senate voted for cloture to bring the Senate's T-HUD bill to the floor for consideration with strong bipartisan support. We anticipated that roughly the same number of senators who initially voted for cloture at this point to limit the debate on the bill would later support cloture to end the debate, which would allow the chamber to proceed to a final vote on the bill. However, consideration of the Senate T-HUD bill stalled for about a week while the chamber considered other legislation and federal appointments. And in the meantime, on July 30th, the House began to consider its own version of the T-HUD bill. As it became clear, though, that enough members felt that the cuts to programs under the House's bills, low spending levels were too deep for the bill to pass, House leadership pulled its own bill from consideration on July 31st. 
In many ways, the failure of the House version of the bill was a victory for advocates and a testament to the great work you've all done recently to demonstrate the impact budget cuts are having on local programs. However, the decision to pull the House bill came at unfortunate timing. The next day, August 1st, the Senate resumed its consideration of the legislation, but due to the failure of the House bill, pressure from Republican leadership to oppose the Senate bill quickly increased, resulting in all but one Republican voting in opposition of cloture that would have ended debate on the bill and allowed it to proceed for a final vote. Therefore, the legislation was unfortunately blocked from passing through the Senate shortly before members of Congress headed home the following afternoon for the August recess. So during August, all legislative action um, came to a standstill, and we encouraged you all to host site visits to take advantage of members of Congress being home in your districts for the month. And now that we're nearing the end of the recess, we're preparing for members of Congress to reconvene next Monday and hopefully take action on furthering legislation in the nine legislative days they will have prior to the end of the fiscal year at the end of the month. Now I'm going to pass this over to Jordan Press, Director of Federal Policy at the Corporation for Supportive Housing, to give you an update about what September is likely to look like and possible outcomes for FY 2014 funding. Jordan? Thank you, Julie. And thank you also to the National Alliance for inviting me and inviting CSH to um, participate in this webinar. Um, the first thing that I wanted to uh, express to folks on the call is that anyone who tells you that they know how things are going to happen and play out with funding and legislation over the next few months um, simply doesn't know what they're talking about. Uh, that is not just my opinion, uh, but what congressional staff and administration staff have told me too. Um, there is a lot of uncertainty, um, but please don't confuse this as meaning that uh, everyone on this call uh, advocates uh, other stakeholders can sit on our laurels. On the contrary, it means that we, first of all, need to keep up our drumbeat of messaging, uh, which both Kate and I will talk about a little bit more uh, on this call later on, and also that we need to pay close attention to what is happening in Washington because it's likely that once things start to move, uh, that things could happen very quickly. So all of this said, uh, we do know that two things are going to happen. First is that there is going to be another continuing resolution. As Julie just mentioned, uh, Congress only had nine legislative days to resolve all of its funding bills before the fiscal year ends uh, at the end of this month. And it was pretty doubtful from the get-go that they would have reached uh, all of these agreements. Now that um, the Syria resolution, uh, the request from the President for military action in Syria is up and taking up more legislative time, it is pretty much a certainty that they are going to need more time beyond September 30th to resolve their, uh, their funding uh, issues and, and pass the funding bills. The other thing that we know is that the $17.6 trillion federal borrowing limit, um, what people might know as the, the debt ceiling, uh, will uh, be need to, we're going to need to lift it by mid-October in order to ensure that the government can continue to meet its payment obligations. So we're setting up what seems to be increasingly more uh, common uh, in D.C. over the last couple of years, which is the perfect storm of Congress waiting till the final moment to figure out whether they're going to kick the can down the road more, more modestly address our fiscal challenges, or, uh, which has not really happened to date, um, uh, more significantly address our, our fiscal challenges, but certainly uh, the, the hope of, of many is that that will occur one of these days. So in my judgment, uh, having been involved in these issues for over 10 years, I would say that the most likely scenario is we see a short-term continuing resolution uh, sometime in September uh, that will take us probably to the time where the debt ceiling has to get uh, debated um, in October. So that might mean a 30 or 45 day continuing resolution. With the thought being that um, around the time of the debt ceiling that um, that is when uh, some, some funding agreements can be reached. Um, after that point, um, mid-October, late October, we will either see a long-term continuing resolution, which means that the funding levels from last year uh, will be uh, continued on to keep 
government operating into next year. Um, and I think that there's a smaller but a still existent chance that we package all of the spending bills together into an omnibus uh, spending bill. I think that that would probably be better for some of our programs. Some important things that we don't know. We don't know um, whether a longer term uh, continuing, continuing resolution or an omnibus is going to happen. And until the, the uh, debt ceiling issue is resolved, we're, we're probably not going to know that. If there is a continuing resolution, uh, the big question is going to be, what's the overall spending limit? Is it going to be based on uh, the pre-sequestration numbers, so that means the funding levels that were passed last year, or is it going to be based on the numbers after um, the sequester lumped off 5% from the amount that was spent last year? So there, there are just too many variables here to make a good guess of how this is going to be resolved. Um, another unknown is that in the case of a continuing resolution, Congress often creates anomalies. And these are uh, funding adjustments um, from, the, from the previous year. Um, in the past, McKinney has benefited from these anomalies, as has Section 8 tenant base. And we, we don't know if any anomalies are going to be allowed. I know specifically that the White House Office of Management and Budget which is responsible for telling congressional appropriators whether any anomalies are needed and whether any will be allowed, have not yet made their report to the, to the Appropriations Committee. So you can go to the next slide. A couple of wild cards on um, how things are going to play out. First of all, there are potentially some very big uh, defense spending matters that could wind up working to the advantage of a striking a, a bigger uh, spending deal and, and hopefully getting an om omnibus um, that would that would be more beneficial to HUD and other domestic discretionary spending. Uh, there is money that is needed uh, if they do in fact pass the um, authorization in Syria as well as some lingering uh, kick the can issues that are uh, rather under the radar right now but they might wind up forcing the hands of Republicans and Democrats to resolve their differences on other spending matters. Keep in mind that cuts to defense spending was the lever that uh, Democrats used when they passed the Budget Control Act and the sequester, um, and what they've relied on in, in this battle to bring Republicans to the table on non-defense spending. Um, so we are uh, not sure how this is all going to play out, but it bears watching. Um, the second wild card where we do have some influence is that uh, the impact, uh, what is the impact of the sequester over the coming months and how are we going to effectively communicate it? We're used to hearing that Democrats describe their concerns about sequestration, uh, but even the top Republican in the House Appropriations Committee, Harold Rogers, has called funding levels under the sequester unsustainable. So I think a question that all of us need to ask ourselves is how well are we going to tell the story about the impacts of the cuts of sequester? Um, I, my judgment, we need to do a better job. And that means not only looking at the McKinney account, but also looking at public housing, Section 8, home funding, CDBG funding. We need to tell clear stories about what the cuts mean to vulnerable families, and we need to um, effectively communicate those stories uh, not only to our neighbors and others in the community, uh, but also to, to policymakers. A couple of other items that are on the horizon that I think are worth mentioning. Um, the FHA, uh, I'm sorry, FHFA, which is the um, agency that oversees Fed, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Um, they uh, their commissioner is going to be, uh, there's a new commissioner who's been nominated, Mel Watt, uh, who's a, a, a longtime Democrat representative from North Carolina. Now, if Watt is to be confirmed, um, and this is why this is important, um, the commissioner of the FHFA uh, gets to make a decision about whether or not Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are going to be com uh, committing funds to the National Housing Trust Fund. When the National Housing Trust Fund was created, it said it would be funded by um, uh, profits at Fannie and Freddie. I'm sorry, it's 
really about the amount of new business that Fannie and Freddie do. Um, but that was suspended uh, right after the bill was passed uh, because of fiscal concerns at, at Fannie and Freddie. Now that they are uh, operating and turning uh, grand profits, the question is whether uh, under Mel Watt's leadership versus under the, the existing commissioner, uh, whether he, uh, he would allow for those payments uh, to, to flow to the trust fund, which would obviously be um, a great source of capital money for affordable housing. There was some Section 8 uh, reform language that was included in the Senate T-HUD appropriations bill uh, before it collapsed. And so there's some questions about what the future of that would be. Um, certainly if there's an omnibus, uh, there's a better chance of it being enacted into law versus a CR. Uh, although if there were a CR, a, a continuing resolution, it's, it's not uh, impossible for that language to be included. Um, there's also the possibility that the Senate Banking Committee uh, takes up Section 8 reform legislation. I think that that's uh, uh, unlikely, but uh, I'm still uh, hopeful on it, and I think it's still worthwhile for us to do advocacy, urging members of the Senate Banking Committee to take up that legislation. And finally, and I know that Kate is going to talk more about this, um, whether Congress makes some fixes to the Hearth Act um, for some issues that I know a lot of people on this call uh, have been concerned about. So I am going to stop there, look forward to your questions, uh, thank the Alliance again for inviting me and CSH to participate, and turn it over to Kate. Thanks, Jordan. Um, so as Jordan said, I want to talk a little bit about the, the hearth rental assistance fix that he just mentioned. Um, and then uh, I, think, I think we brushed over it pretty quickly. So we're going to go back and talk a little bit more about uh, sequestration in particular and what it means for FY 2013 and FY 2014 funding um, and just try and recap a little bit of that stuff uh, in a little more detail since we have a little bit of time. Um, and then we'll go in and talk about sort of advocacy and advocacy messaging. Um, so uh, this is the, the final piece of non-funding related to legislation we're going to talk about. Uh, it's H.R. 2790, um, which I think probably a lot of you have heard about. It's the legislation that was recently introduced in the House of Representatives to fix the nonprofits not being allowed to administer a rental assistance issue uh, that, of course, came up with the release of the continuum of care regulations last year. Um, Representative Scott Peters uh, from California heard that this was an issue, uh, so he's written some simple legislation that basically says uh, that nonprofits will be allowed to administer rental assistance through the continuum of care. Uh, so now the legislation exists, it's been introduced in the House, uh, and it sits in the Financial Services Committee awaiting, uh, awaiting action, uh, and it needs co-sponsors to ensure that it has uh, sufficient support to pass. Um, so the ask here really is to get your members to co-sponsor this legislation. Um, I think many of you also know that the Senate funding bill uh, the, that Julie talked about earlier, um, the uh, FY 2014 T-HUD funding bill also included language that would allow nonprofits to administer rental assistance. Um, but of course, as Julie mentioned, that legislation is currently stalled. Uh, so we need to make sure that H.R. 2790 uh, gets support in lieu, out, uh, in lieu of the uh, Senate funding bill. Um, and we'll keep everyone posted on this legislation, um, along with all the things that Jordan spoke about, um, particularly Section 8 reform. Uh, and hopefully, you know, we can get uh, H.R. 2790 uh, through both chambers pretty quickly um, and get a fix to that problem that I know communities are pretty concerned about. Um, so with that, uh, we can uh, just touch back on sequestration quickly, um, just to remind people sort of what that looks like and what that will mean. So. Julie, if you wouldn't mind just talking a little bit more about that, so reminding folks what it meant for HUD programs in 2013 and what it will mean for the next you know, eight years, that would be great. Sure. Um, so sequestration, sorry, you wanted me to address 2013 and the next Sure, the, the initial sequestration cuts and then yeah. you know, things moving forward, what sequestration looks like you know, for the next eight years, the, the BCA caps and things like that. Okay, so um, so for FY 2013, sequestration um, cuts, they were already applied to those levels. Um, so that's what you have heard us um, talking about in our advocacy updates and um, such for the past um, few months. And so that all kind of started in March um, when those FY 2013 levels were finalized. 
and then um, the so the the um, DCA, the Budget Control Act of 2011, that kind of set that top line spending number um, that the federal government can spend for the next eight years. Um, so sequestration would um, continue to be applied. So for FY 2014, um, we're looking at sequestration being applied again. Um, so we're really looking through the FY 2014 appropriations to um, make up funding that's being lost through sequestration cuts. So that's kind of the summary on that. OK. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. So sequestration is a really complicated issue. I mean, it's a, sort of a one-two punch of something that happened automatically to one year, but now it sets out sort of these cuts um, over the long run. So if you have any other questions about it um, and you want a little more detail, go ahead and ask them, and we'll do our best to, to sort of answer it. Um, but as Julie said, sort of the bottom line here is that sequestration means big cuts. Um, to programs, you know, now some have already happened, some will happen, uh, and they'll continue to happen from sequestration. So our options here are really get rid of sequestration, uh, as Jordan talked about, and let let Congress know these issues, um, or alternatively, you know, make up funding another way. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, basically right now. Um, so. Uh, to get back to the advocacy and messaging, um, I w and again, if you have any questions about you know what's happened in the past few months with this legislation and things like that, please go ahead and ask them in the question box, um, and we'll make sure to get to them. Um, but right now, I want to talk about National Call-In Week uh, that we're hoping to have next week to drum up as much support for HUD funding as possible. Um, so as Julie said, Congress gets back from its August recess next Monday, September 9th. Uh, so we're going to start off the short September legislative activity uh, with a flurry of calls to make sure each member hears early and often uh, that HUD programs do matter. Um, making calls next week in particular will ensure that we can impact the process before big decisions are made um, and ensure that more money for HUD is on everyone's minds as they sort of make these negotiations and uh, address some of the things that Jordan discussed. Um, Obviously, we want to make as much of an impact as possible and try to get as many calls as we can. Um, we're setting the goal of getting 250 calls in five days. Um, and I know that is pretty ambitious, to put it in perspective. Uh, we need everyone on this webinar right now to make one call, and we'd be all set. So not, not too crazy. Um, you know, we at the Alliance, we love setting these ambitious, ambitious goals for our advocacy work, uh, and I am always so blown away uh, at how much we completely just blow them blow them out of the water. So uh, we do a great job, and I'm really hoping to see that next week. Um, but in order to just reach that goal and hopefully just totally surpass it, we definitely need to make sure that we spread the word on this as much as possible. So you know, get your coworkers to make calls, your friends, your clients, your board members, really anyone who feels passionate about these low, key low-income housing and homelessness programs. Uh, and the fact that they need more money should, should make a call next week. Um, and since, of course, we have a goal, please do make sure to loop back with me uh, to let me know just so we can keep track and ensure that we do reach that. Um, and I'll talk about messaging in just a second so that you can uh, you know, sort of use that through these calls. Uh, and we'll also have a lot of materials you can use to help mobilize others and help uh, craft your conversations. Um, so well, everything that Jordan and Julie discussed earlier, you know, about what might happen and what hap ha has happened, uh, probably seems really complicated and is, in fact, really complicated. Uh, the fortunate part is that the messaging in all of this is actually pretty simple. Um, you know, as you can see, when it comes to HUD funding, there are just a few key messages to get across. Uh, namely, that in all of these budget negotiations and attempts to balance the budget and reduce federal spending, um, we need to make sure that we're cognizant of the needs of our lowest income people. You know, it's all well and good to reduce spending and balance the budget, but it cannot happen on the backs of our neediest people. Uh, cutting HUD programs like McKinney, Section 8, and many of the others that we've mentioned really does just that. So we need to make sure that Congress knows that, that you know, if you want to balance the budget, do not do it on the backs of the poor. It's just simply unacceptable. Um, it's also important to note that when we're talking about HUD programs, we're also talking about a very small slice of the federal budget. Um, and of course, you could say that out of a lot of things, but HUD really is you know, on the smaller side in terms of departments and programs. Um, and you know we are more than capable, despite all these issues as a nation, uh, to fund these programs at the levels proposed by the Senate. That's why they created the bill. That's why they you know set those levels. They understood that. Um, and frankly, we, we really need to do that. 
So the Senate created a bill that was working within current law, um, the, the Budget Control Act. It, it fit under that. And uh, just because we can make further cuts to these programs, of course, absolutely doesn't mean that we should. Uh, so again, it's important to let our members of Congress on both sides of the aisle and in both chambers know that we strongly support the Senate's HUD funding bill, uh, which included significant increases for key programs that we touched on earlier. Um, and this includes, of course, the $2.26 billion for HUD's McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Grants. Um, and as Julie discussed, that funding level in particular, along with many of the other funding levels uh, for HUD programs in the Senate bill, will do a lot more than the House's funding levels. Um, it, the House, House's bill doesn't even come close. Um, so sequestration uh, quickly caused a lot of damage to a lot of HUD programs, you know, especially Section 8. Uh, and we haven't even begun to feel its full impact yet. Um, and basically, as I mentioned just a little earlier, we need to nip this in the bud. Um, and if sequestration and these caps on the federal spending are, are here to stay, uh, then we need to make sure that these programs receive the funding they need in other ways, like through the annual federal funding process. Um, I'll reiterate this again, but the important and simple streamlined message for call and week and you know, the next few weeks and all your uh, conversations with your members of Congress and their offices is that we just simply need more funding for HUD programs. That's kind of the bottom line. Pretty simple. More money for HUD. Um, to get a little bit into the nitty gritty of the messaging that you can use, uh, Many of these next points that I'm about to talk about could apply to the vast majority of HUD programs. Um, so, but I'll be kind of couching them in terms of uh, the McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Grants. But it is important to note that I think a lot of these points do really apply to a lot of HUD programs, uh, particularly those focused on homelessness and low-income housing programs. Um, so uh, so it's important to note uh, that the need is evident for nearly all HUD programs. Uh, and those HUD programs targeted toward low-income people uh, they really do save save money in the long run. So it's important to note that, that all these programs are important and really a lot of them do work to, to save money. Um, so in terms of McKinney, we know that federal investment uh, has already made a huge difference when it comes to preventing and ending homelessness. Um, even in the past few days, as it turns out, we've seen a flurry of news articles uh, stating that the number of people experiencing homelessness has remained steady in the face of serious adversity, meaning uh, the economy, um, you know, funding cuts, and everything like that. Uh, and we know that you know, we've seen the numbers hold steady because of HPRP and the other federal programs targeted toward preventing and ending homelessness. Simply, they just work. And they do what they need to do um, in a cost-efficient, cost-effective way. Um, secondly, as I just mentioned, uh, these programs are definitely in need. Uh, the last McKinney NOFA, COC NOFA, required communities to tier their programs, as I'm sure many of you recall, uh, and assess which programs might not be funded. And of course, that was really difficult, and a lot of people struggled with that. Um, and the next NOFA will present an even greater challenge, uh, of course, in, in sort of that tiering and figuring out which programs will get cut. Um, these programs uh, and HUD programs in general really need more money to maintain their existing uh, or pre-sequestration pre levels to get us back to where we were. Um, without that, we're going to put a much bigger strain on systems down the line like the homeless assistance system or even systems like emergency rooms, jails, uh, and other last-ditch efforts. And we know, we all know as, a, as community by community and as a nation that that just doesn't work. That's not efficient, it doesn't help, it doesn't house people, uh, and it doesn't work. So we need to make sure that these programs are doing what they can do. Um, and as I keep saying, uh, finally, you know, we know these programs work. Uh, and we've seen it with the numbers. And we know that these programs save money. Uh, and you know, they, as such, because they work, because they do great stuff, they have a long history of bipartisan support. Um, and again, it would be a shame to mar a program that has such a solid history in these greater efforts to, to balance the budget. You know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't let programs that are really great and do great things just fall through the cracks in efforts to balance the budget. Um, again, what we really need to emphasize here is that HUD programs are doing fantastic work in our communities. Uh, we need to make sure our members know and understand this, and we need to be the ones to tell them. We as constituents, uh, and people that run these programs and know about them need to be the ones to tell them about the number of people our McKinney programs are housing or how many people Section 8 programs are keeping housed and out of homelessness and just everything in between. And everything in between. Um, we need to call next week and tell them that, again, simply HUD programs need more money. 
Um, so to wrap up, uh, and sort of as a reminder, we'll be sending out a recording of this webinar uh, along with re relevant materials in the next day or so to get everyone ready for the call-in week next week. Um, in the meantime, feel free to get in touch with uh, Jordan or I. Our contact information is up there if you have any further questions about any of this or any concerns. Um, and then you can see the McKinney FY 2014 McKinney campaign, campaign page is up on your screen, uh, the URL, um, if you want to uh, check out any of the uh, sample action or McKinney one-pagers or things like that um, that, again, we'll be sending around. So, um, Jordan, I'm going to toss it to you again. Do you have anything that you'd like to, to wrap up with? Yeah, so I, I see a lot of questions on here about for, you know, asking for further clarification around the sequester. I know that Julie spoke about it a little bit, and I wanted to take take another shot at this. Um, the the way that the sequester works, uh, based on um, when the Budget Control Act was passed, is that there are uh, spending limits each year for defense and for non-defense programs. Um, and what it says is that each year you can only add a certain amount uh, to the budget. It's called new budget authority. So uh, each year, so what, what the law says under the sequester is for fiscal year 13, 14, 15, and so on, um, new budget authority may not exceed a, cert, a certain amount, $100 billion, uh, you know, $100 billion in, in new spending and so forth. Um, and anything that goes above that gets sequestered down. So when we say um, that uh, spending will be cut by certain amounts, um, that, that, that's probably the 5% the number is, uh, is certainly what it was last year, and it's a, it's a fair average. But it get, it's more complicated than that. We have to look at kind of what what the overall spending picture is, whether any programs have been modified, um, and um, you know, and, and, and some other complicating factors. But I hope that that explains a little bit more about how how the sequester works. Each year, we have a certain amount of budget authority and new budget authority based on how programs grow, and um, we cannot grow the programs more than a certain amount under the sequester. If Congress decides to appropriate uh, money that that uh, goes beyond that new budget authority, it gets sequestered or cut and recaptured back uh, to the Treasury Department. I hope that helps. Yeah, that was fantastic. Thank you. Is there anything else that you wanted to touch on before we just go to other questions? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, we can just work on the okay. questions. Julie, you want to throw out some questions? Yeah, sure. um, so thanks, Kate. All right, at this point, um, so we'll go to a few questions. And I just want to remind everyone that the floor is still open to new questions, so just feel free to submit them as we continue. Um, and we won't be able to probably um, get to all the questions, so if um, they're a little bit more localized or specific, we'll be responding to you after the webinar individually. So the first question we have um, for um, Jordan is, do you foresee a government shutdown occurring? Sure. Uh, good question. Um, and I know I responded directly to this question asker, but um, <laughs> it, if you had asked me this question a week ago, I would have said, uh, I think that there's a 50-50 shot um, just because of how much uh, vitriol there is among the right wing of the Republican Party um, and you know them wanting to, to draw a line in the sand um, around Obamacare and, and so forth. My feeling um, right now is that with with the potential action around Syria, that it it gives a little bit of cover for the moderate Republicans who may have been pressured into shutting down the government over Obamacare or or, or otherwise, the ones who didn't really want to shut it down, but you know the, the a lot of the the right kind of more conservative wing of the party want to do it and they're going to go ahead with it. I think that with Syria um, that there's more cover for them to say, look, we, we didn't really get a chance to uh, 
negotiate and put our, our make our demands clear. The administration didn't have a sufficient amount of time to negotiate with us. So we went ahead and, and authorized a, a continuing resolution for a certain number of months or for a year uh, that will keep spending levels low is probably what they'll say. Um, you know, and not grow the government uh, more, um, not grow the government too much uh, and w we needed to take care of some of our obligations. You know, because of Syria, I will continue to fight to, you know, keep spending in check. That that's so. Right right now, if you ask me today, will there be a government shutdown? I think it's pretty unlikely. And this is Kate. And I just you know my random two cents to that uh, is that that's a really great point. I also recently, I mean, for what it's worth, I read a poll that the RNC put out. Um, uh, which is the Republican National Committee uh, that polled a whole bunch of Republicans and you know a, a just random constituent Republicans asking about this, and there was kind of an overwhelming "we don't want a government shutdown." Uh, so, you know, whether or not people pay attention to that, that's a whole other story. But there doesn't seem to be a lot of will for it right now. Um, it's kind of seen as just a mess. So, I, I would also agree with with Jordan and say, who knows? But we could uh, open the paper tomorrow and find something totally different. But um, I think as things stand right now, probably not. Great. Thank you both. Um, so the next question we have is, will the Senate THUD bill we see um, that could come back to the floor as the question is posed be the same as the one that failed previously? Could either of you provide some clarification on this? Uh, so. That's, I mean, that's a good question. Uh, the answer is that we don't really know. Mm -hmm. I don't think the Senate THUD bill, that S-1243 that we saw um, that Julie talked about is all the action they took on it um, on August 1st, um, will come back again. Um, I think right now, uh, and Jordan, please feel free to speak to this, that we're going to sort of take what exists. Um, and it probably, the, the bill the House has and the bill the Senate has won't pass either chamber, um, but what they'll do is take sort of the content of those and, and figure something out uh, or just kind of skip right to a, a CR. So uh, it, it could change. Um, it will probably, you know, go back to something in between what the House and Senate has. Um, it, it really depends on, on how things go and if they do, you know, if they have any plans to actually pass. FY 2014 bills, or if it will just be um, a CR with those anomalies that Jordan was talking about, or, or something like that. Anything okay. to add, Jordan? Nope. I... Okay. Great. Thanks so much, Kate. And another for either of you. Um, are the Alliance, the Corporation for Supportive Housing, or any other national organizations tracking the impacts of sequestration? Um, yes. Um, the organization that I think has been doing the best job um, in, in taking the lead around stories of sequestration is called the Coalition for Human Needs. Um, it's a pretty broad coalition um, of, uh, of organizations, and, and they have been tracking it. CSH and the Alliance are both involved in a, uh, a more insular DC group called the Campaign for Housing Community Development Financing. Um, and uh, that that group has been gathering stories as well. Um, if you have some, please send them our way, uh, and we will uh, report them to um, either to CHCDF or to uh, Coalition for Human Needs. Yeah, and to that same vein, someone um, asked about you know how do we how do how do organizations sort of get across the impacts. Um, and a lot of what CHN is collecting and what we're collecting is partly anecdotes, but it's par partially, uh, a large part of it, rather, is uh, media stories. Um, so cuts, you know, stories, what we've been seeing a lot of are Section 8 stories. So stories like your local PHA is having to uh, turn people away, or people that originally, you know, were about to be housed next week are told, just kidding, we don't have any housing for you. Um, a lot of those stories have been making it, particularly into, like, local papers. Um, 
So if you have, you know, anecdotes like that or you've seen something like that, reaching out to your, to your local papers is, is really a good first start. Um, you know, stories like that, uh, particularly now and as things move forward and sequestration becomes, again, a little more of a buzzword among, amidst all these bigger negotiations, these stories will get, I think, you know, uh, they'll, people will pay attention to them. Um, so that's, that's a really good way, you know, just start advertising it. Um, or just, you know, as, as part of your calls next week, just talk about this. You know, we've been seeing X number of people uh, impacted by sequestration. We're going to have to cut, you know, X number of beds because of sequestration. So we need more money. Things like that um, I think are really the best way. Um, like Jordan said, we had a call um, a little bit ago to, to collect sequestration stories. Uh, we did some advocacy efforts on that. So if you do have anything, um, please do let us know and we pass it along. Uh, and that sort of gets compiled into this nationwide thing uh, that we you know, plan on and have been um, letting members know about. So um, that's sort of the, the best way to approach that right now. Great. Thanks, Kate. Um, we have a few more questions. I just want to remind everyone that the floor is still open to submit questions if you have any more as we go through. Um, our next question is, how can I sign up for advocacy alerts so I can be alerted, alerted to timely opportunities to take advocacy actions? Kate? Well, well that's a great question. Um, <laughs> I know uh, CSH also has their own stuff, so Jordan you can also talk about it, but um, right on our website, website and homelessness.org. We have some good, uh, we have a, a newsletter sign up thing if you just want to enter your email into that and then you can select all the newsletters. There's an advocacy update um, that we give you all this information about when to act and what's going on. Um, we also have a McKinney uh, Vento Homeless Assistance Grants funding specific uh, campaign um, that you can see up there on your screen if you just want to email me to get on that list. Um, we would be more than happy to have you, and that has uh, more HUD, but really McKinney-specific uh, alerts on funding and the HEARTH Act, uh, and that you know HR 2790 um, and things like that. Um, so that's that's the best way to get involved with the uh, the alliance. Jordan, do you have anything to add for CSH? Um, just from our website, csh.org, um, you can sign up for our alerts, um, and we also uh, publish a fair amount on our blog, which is called The Pipeline. Um, so in addition to signing up for um, CSH News, I encourage you to check out The Pipeline. It's our most up-to-date uh, information. Great, thank you. Um, and I just wanted to provide clarification on one of the questions. One of the questions was, how are, how will there be more funding in FY 2014 to make up for sequestration? Um, and I had mentioned that we are trying to um, grow funding to make up for sequestration cuts. It's not that there will be more funding. It's that we um, are trying to um, prove the point to lawmakers that increased funding in FY 2014 is necessary, um, especially due to sequestration cuts. So what I meant is we're trying to make up um, for the funding lost through sequestration, really harsh cuts through FY 2014 appropriations by trying to get robust levels of funding for our key programs. So I just wanted to provide that clarification. And we also had another question. Um, are either of you aware of good resources for um, cost effectiveness studies on housing data? Sure, I know CSH has some good stuff. <laughs> we do. We do up on our website. Yeah, the CSH has a great resource section um, and it has studies and things. Um, it, the Alliance's website also has um, a section and I can't access it right now, but uh, you know you can just search in our website and homelessness.org cost savings, and you'll see some some uh, uh, old um, research uh, studies that have come up with some of the cost savings. You know, average cost per intervention versus average cost of um, jail or emergency room stays and things like that uh, that are pretty helpful and are community specific, but I think do a lot to apply to, uh, you know, a wider range, sort of the same concept, you know, how much does it cost, does it cost to house someone, um, versus letting them live on the streets and things like that. Um, so uh, there is actually a lot out there. Um, I know this is kind of random, but the best thing really to do is either search on our site or just do a Google search, um, and you'll, you'll be able to find quite a bit of stuff. 
I'd also give a shout out to our friends at the um, Supportive Housing Network of New York, SHINI. Uh, they have a really good uh, page that compiles some cost study um, cost studies. Great, thanks so much. So I think we just have one final question, um, and this is a bit nitty gritty. This is if the FY 2013 COC NOFA will be tied to the same funding amount as the FY 2012 budget, will this still include some cuts due to sequestration? And then um, the second part is newer, also due to new renewals. Will this actually result in a chance that all renewals will not be awarded? And how would this impact funding for new projects? Okay, uh, so the first thing there is that the FY 2013 COC NOVA is not the same as 2012. Um, I think it, the, there was a CR in 2013 that basically applied all 2012 levels to 2013 programs. Um, however, the McKinney Vento Homeless Assistance Grants were not part of that. They got an anomaly, Jordan was talking about that, uh, that basically gave them increased funding. So between 2012 and 2013, uh, even post-sequestration, McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Grants received a funding increase. Um, so enough of an increase that even when they got cut by sequestration, those 5% across the board cuts, they still got an increase. So the 2013 NOFA will not be the same as the 2012 NOFA. Um, however, it uh, will still include cuts. Uh, the 2013 NOFA will have cuts. Um, because of renewal demand, uh, what we're going to probably see, um, like I talked about in that 2012 NOFA, communities had to tier their programs, tier one and tier two, figuring out what was uh, going to be um, funded or not uh, in the 2013 NOFA, probably look pretty similar, only uh, there will be certain amount, about six to eight percent of your programs that will certainly be cut. Um, you know, not maybe, but very, very most definitely. Um, I hope that answers the question. Uh, so increased renewal demand, we're going to see some programs that exist being cut. Great. And no, no new money for new projects. No money for new projects. There was a, a pretty good summary that um, HUD's SNAP's office posted on one CPD. Um, if you uh, go to that website, one, uh, spelled out, O-N-E-C-P-D, uh, that uh, there's, a, there's a good letter from, uh, from the SNAPS office at HUD that explains you know, what's going on with the competitions. Uh, one final thing I do want to touch on is the trust fund. I think we talked about a few non-funding things that were going to happen, um, uh, including you know, the HEARTH Act and FHA. FHA FA administrator and things like that. Uh, and we talked a little bit about uh, Fannie and Freddie and, and GSE, but um, uh, in terms of the trust fund in general, so in case people don't know, um, I mean, you should definitely go to the trust fund website and LIHDs. Uh, they have United for Homes campaign has a ton of great information. Um, but just to give people a quick update, they're uh, hopefully going to get uh, once if tax reform becomes an issue, um, and that's something that people begin to touch on for the remainder of the year. Um, they're going to try and get some funding through mortgage interest deduction, uh, change in the mortgage interest deduction, and some savings from that to fund the housing trust fund. Um, so, you know, outlook on that kind of unclear. Uh, people, there needs to be a lot of political will for some serious tax reform. Um, but uh, there is a pretty solid proposal out there that United Homes has, and that they're pushing very hard. Um, so that's going to there's going to be a steady drumbeat on that, um, and certainly it won't won't go away. Uh, so I I can't speak to what might happen with that, but um, it, it's definitely out there. People are definitely working on it. Uh, so funding for the trust fund is still very much an active legislative thing right now. Okay, great. Thanks, Kate. Um, Jordan, is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? Nope. Okay, great. Um, um, so, I will just mm -hmm. remind people that we will be posting uh, a recording of this webinar, so a YouTube video of this webinar that includes the slides and everything we're saying uh, on our website. Um, and I will be sending out probably once that recording is 
up and posted. I'll be sending out an email to everyone who registered for this webinar. Um, just you know, information uh, that we talked about, some of those one pagers and things, as long as a cop as well as a copy of the slides and all that good stuff. So we will be sending that out. Someone asked again for the website for One CPD. Um, again, it's the word one spelled out O N E C P D. Dot info is the website. Um, and we also talked about Shinny. That's S H N N Y dot org, uh, as in the Supportive Housing Network of New York dot org. Uh, and for more information on the trust fund, you can uh, search for the United for Homes campaign, um, or go to the N L I H C website, the National Low Income Housing Coalition dot org. Uh, and they have a ton of information on on the trust fund up there. Um, all right, well, thanks everyone. Um, with that, we will close out here. Uh, and again, our contact information is up on the screen. So if you have any other questions, uh, you know, please feel free to, to shoot them over to us um, and we'll do our best to answer them. Um, and you'll definitely be hearing from me in the next few days about call-in week next week. And I'm really excited to get everyone involved in that. So thank you so much uh, and hope you have a great rest of your afternoon.